In this third video on my automatic pellet dispenser, I'm going to show you the assembly steps, how to flash the code, and a few other cool things that can be done with the device. If you haven't seen the first two videos, I recommend to watch them so you know what I talk about in this one. Before we start, a quick note on what this project is about. I initially made this pellet dispenser for my parents' pets, and it was just a fun project that gained a bit of attention during the last months. It is by no means a product in competition with the commercially available pet feeders, it is more of a project for the maker who wants to build a 3D printable pet feeder for himself. I think I failed to address that in former videos and so please consider all of this a work in progress and of course there are many many things that I can improve. After preparing all the electronics the board can now be mounted to the base part. There are two options for the base part in this download kit. One is with screws and one is with a snap-in mount which I'm going to use here in this video. With this one you just snap the peterboard in place and you're good to go. Optionally there are still two holes for two M3 screws that the board can be fixed with. Now you can snap the small cap for the USB port in place. Next up is the 12 volt power supply socket. Insert the plug through the hole. You might need to push it a little bit and then push the actual socket in place. Now we just tighten the socket with the small nut that comes with the part. It is helpful here to use a pair of pliers for the step, since there is not a lot of space to get to it. Now you can also plug in the power supply. For the cable management it is handy to use a few zip ties. For those I added some zip tie tabs in the base part. Pay attention that in your slicer settings you do not use any supports for those channels or it won't be possible to put the zip ties through. You can now manage the cables grounded in the housing and they won't bug you in the next step. The last thing that you will need to do with the solder iron is to melt in the taped inserts. There are seven in total and they will need to be put in the middle part, the potentiometer mount and the base part. I got mine from CNC Kitchen, but you can get them from pretty much anywhere. And they are super easy to melt into a PLA part. Just insert them in the holes and put the temperature to something at around 250 degrees Celsius. The inserts will then slide slowly in place and stop with it once they are plain to the hole. This step needs to be repeated for all the seven inserts. If you have never done that before, you might want to practice it first on a different print. Once the threads are in place, the controls are next. I'm going to start with the push button that mounts in the back of the middle part. This part is also fastened with a small nut and here again it is a bit easier if you use some pliers. After the push button follow the two potentiometers. It is actually a bit easier if you start with them, but it works both ways. The potentiometer mount is then fastened to the middle part with a M4 screw. On the middle part there is also a small recess that you can put the cables through to access the base part. The on off toggle switch is the last control that gets put in place and here are no additional fasteners needed. It clamps into its position just by pushing it into the print part. Now we go to the front of the middle part. Here the four 2mm stainless steel pins need to be squeezed into the printed sockets and it helps to use a smaller hammer to make them slide the last few millimeters. Now for better optics and feeling, the two potentiometers get these small knobs with a small pointer that makes it easier to see the current position. Dial both all the way down and insert the knobs on the potentiometers. The two potis have a range of 270 degrees and if dialed all the way down, so counterclockwise, the pointer should point at roughly half past seven or let's just say the lower left corner. If it is hard to put the knobs in place, print them maybe slightly bigger or hold something against the potentiometer on the back. Otherwise you might push it out of the mount and it needs to be unscrewed again. Next is the only actually moving part and that is the NEMA 17 stepper motor. This one comes with a cable that connects the motor coils to the stepper driver. The standard cable is much too long for what is actually needed and so I usually roll up the remaining length and fix it with zip ties to the tabs in the base. Once that is done, you can plug in the cable to the motor 
and to the board. The stepper that I use here is only 30mm in length and that is really important to note because the standard NEMA 17 motor would not fit into the middle part. If everything was wired correctly it should look something like this. Now the controls can all be plugged into the board. That is a push button, the on off toggle switch and the two potentiometers. It's a bit hard to see here in the shot and for a better reference to where they have to be plugged pay attention to what is written on the PCBA or the circuit diagram. Once all the plugs are inserted the program can be flashed to the controller. Therefore you need a USB-C cable that you connect to your computer. In the download kit you find the latest version of the program that is needed to run the device. It is an Arduino sketch which can be directly uploaded to the controller. At the beginning of the sketch there is a short explanation of what the code actually does when executed and underneath it are all the different pin declarations. If you are totally new to the programming of an Arduino, I recommend to watch some tutorials on that first, since there is definitely some background knowledge to be had. But just to summarize it for you in a few words, the isTimeElapsed function waits until the set time has elapsed and then starts dispensing the amount of rotations that the other potentiometer readout gives back. Also, there are different functions that get triggered if the button is pushed. In general, everything should work right away, but as always with a project like this, there can be some trouble when trying to upload the sketch. Select the right board, which is the Arduino Nano, and since this is quite an old controller, it can be necessary as well to select the old bootloader. Make sure you use the right USB port, and then you're good to go. Sometimes when uploading something to the Nano for the first time, it somehow works more reliable when the controller is not plugged into the board. I don't really know why, and it's only for the first time, maybe someone else can explain that to me. Once you did that, you can hit upload and the program will be flashed on the controller. For checking if everything works well, I added some serial prints that you can display on the serial monitor. This way you can check the values of the potentiometers for time that should be between 1 and 24 hours and for volume that should be between 1 and 10 rotations of the screw. Also you can control if all the functions are executed when pushing the button. If all that has worked successfully, you can now power up the device for the first time with the 12 volt power supply. Then the push button can be pushed to check if the rotation of the motor works well, and if so, 80% of the build is done at this point. If the screw turns in the wrong direction, then that is because the plug for the motor cable was the wrong way around. That can be fixed by simply plugging the cable the other way, and because the coil pairs of the motor are then switched, the motor will turn the other way around. The screw should obviously push the material and not try to retract it. And now the final assembly can start. For this step, unplug the motor once more and route the cable through the big recess in the middle part. Then arrange the cables so that the two parts can be put together without anything bothering between them. I added small cones to the prints that help align the parts in one correct position and you will see that they are aligned perfectly when the gap between the prints disappears. Note that the power supply socket from the base part has to be underneath the controls of the middle part. Then use three M4 screws to join the two parts together. The ones in the video here are just for display, so if it is used later with pet food, it is actually better to use ones from stainless steel. Now the motor can be installed together with the shield and the feed screw. The feed screw can simply be pushed over the motor shaft with the hole facing to the flat part of the motor shaft. I found that the friction of the two parts is enough to hold them in place and there is not actually an additional screw needed. Afterwards the motor can be plugged again and inserted into its position. The small cover that I call the shield relieves the screw from additional pressure from the pellets above and makes the suspension much more reliable. The part slides into its position and is fastened with two M3 screws. Then check if the motor turns freely without any friction and that part is done as well. If everything has been done right, it should sound and look something like this. The hardest parts are done. Now it is only the nozzle outlet that has to be pushed over the pins. Usually that fits quite well, but in some cases a really firm push is needed. And the pellet tank. This one also has small cones that need to be aligned. The tank is tightened to the middle part with 3 and 4 screws. Those are a bit hard to reach, but with a normal Allen key it is manageable. 
The last part is the lid that is screwed on top of the pellet tank. That was the last step and with that you can test the device with some real material. If you have made it until here, you successfully built yourself a pit rope and I hope that you will find this device useful for whatever you're going to use it for. Just a few more things now at the end of this video. In the download kit there are several variations for parts, like the nozzle for example. There's one that is a bowl and another one that is made to dispense into two containers. You're free to choose a design for your specific need or add one of your own that you made. I would absolutely love to see a few remixes of this tiny machine. On the PCB, we routed all the remaining pins from the nano to sockets on the perimeter. If you want to add additional functionality or any sensors, you're free to do so of course. I often use one of the digital pins to dispense food for my videos. If pin 3 is shorted with ground, the device starts dispensing until the connection is open again. That is actually still in the code and that should work for you right away too. One more important note. The device is not perfect and still a work in progress, so test it firmly before you completely rely on it to feed your pet or to do anything. If you are still in the video, my dear thank you for watching this. The project has been an amazing journey and I hope it might have inspired you to build something yourself. If you're interested in the project or want to follow the journey, feel free to visit my Instagram where I document the development or have a look at my Ko-fi where I publish different design files or my Patreon if you consider supporting my projects.